Hi everyone, today's episode is going to be on the SS Moro Castle, which was an American ocean liner that had caught fire and ran aground on the morning of September 8th in 1934. It was en route from Havana, Cuba, to New York City in the United States. The overall loss of this, like, not miraculous, but sudden fire was 137 passengers and crew. The previous evening, the Morrow Castle's captain, Robert Wilmot, had died very suddenly and his place was taken by the chief officer, William Worms. This was right as a strong northeast wind was developing under a really heavy cloud. At 2.50 a.m., the fire was detected in the storage lockers, which burned through electrical cables and engulfed the entire ship in flames and plunged it into darkness. Responses by the crew, Coast Guard, and rescue vessels were very notably slow and obviously inefficient with the fact that that many people had suffered. There was empty capacities in the lifeboat and the decks were too hot to stand on. Smoke made breathing extremely difficult and the passengers were forced to leap into the ocean swells where swimming was basically made impossible because there was this really windy, horrible storm going on. By mid-afternoon, Moro Castle was completely abandoned and the survivors landed on the shores of New Jersey by an assortment of crafts. The cause of the fire was never actually established though an overheated funnel and certain points of the cabin design and electrical circuitry were noted during the investigation saying that they probably weren't properly established. One theory was that arson by one of the crew members had happened and it's attracted support over the years. Although there isn't really any concrete evidence to support that, it is one of the more like favored attributes of what could have caused this. The high number of casualties are chiefly to blame on the crew's incompetent handling of the emergency as it was happening. May 22nd of 1928, the United States passed a Merchant Marine Act creating a $250 million construction fund to be lent to the United States shipping companies to replace old and outdated ships with new ones. Each of these loans, which were subsidized as much as 75% of the cost of the ships, were to be paid back over 20 years at low interest rates. One company that really went for this opportunity was the New York and Cuba Mail Steamship Company, known as the Ward Line, which had been carrying passengers, cargoes, and mail from Cuba since the mid-19th century by that point. Naval architects were hired and the line was to be designed and built by a pair of messenger liners to be named the Moro Castle after the stone fortress and lighthouse in Havana and Orante. At the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company it had begun on the Moro Castle in January of 1929. In March 1930 the ship was christened following in May by her sister ship, the Orante. Each ship was 508 feet long and measured a gross ton of 11,520. They had a turboelectric transmission with general electric twin turbo generators supplying the propulsion motors on the twin propeller shafts. Each ship was luxury, finished to accommodate 489 passengers in the first and in the tourist class, along with 240 crew members and officers. In a growing age of passenger ships, having cruiser sterns like the Murano Castle and Orante were built with classic counter sterns. As built, it was equipped with the direction finding and submarine sailing equipment. Submarine sailing was becoming obsolete as a form of communication. By 1934, it had been removed. By that year, echo sounding equipment and gyro compasses have been installed to the ship. Moro Castle had her maiden voyage on August 23rd of 1930. She lived up to expectations by completing the maiden voyage of 1,100 plus miles southbound in just under 59 hours, and the return trip took only 58. 
Over the next four years, the Moral Castle and the Orante were luxury ship workhorses. They were rarely ever out of service, and despite the worsening of the Great Depression, were able to maintain a steady clientele. Their success was partly due to prohibition, as the trips provided a relatively affordable and legal means of enjoying like a non-stop drinking party, basically at the time where having alcohol wasn't exactly legal everywhere in the majority of places. Their reasonable rates also attracted Cuban and American businessmen and older couples, making the ships a microcosm of America. The final voyage of the Moro Castle began in Havana on September 5th of 1934. On the afternoon of the 6th, as the ship paralleled the southeastern coast of the United States, it began to encounter increasing clouds and heavy wind. By the morning of the 7th, the clouds had thickened and the winds had shifted easternly. That was the first indication of a developing nor'easter. Throughout that day, the winds increased and intermittent rains began causing many to retire to their beds and berths early. Early that evening, Captain Robert Remsen Wilmot had his dinner delivered to his headquarters, and shortly thereafter, he complained of stomach troubles, and not long after the stomach troubles, he had died, apparently of a heart attack. The commander of the ship passed to Chief Officer William Worms. During the overnight hours, the winds had increased to over 30 miles per hour, and the Moreau Castle plotted its way up the eastern seaboard the best it could. On 2.50 a.m. on September 8th, while the ship was sailing around eight nautical miles off of Long Beach Island, a fire was detected in a storage locker. Within the first class writing room on B deck, within the next 30 minutes, the Moro Castle became engulfed in flames. As the fire grew intensely, the acting captain had attempted to beach the ship, but the growing need to launch lifeboats and abandon the ship forced him to give up on that plan. Within 20 minutes of the fire's discovery, at about 3.10 a.m., the fire had burned through the ship's main electrical cables, plunging it into complete darkness. As all of the power was lost, the radio stopped working, so only a single SOS signal was ever sent, and it was about the last time that the wheelhouse had the ability to steer the ship as well because the hydraulic lines were severed by the fire. Cut off by the fire, passengers tended to move towards the stern, and most of the crew members, on the other hand, moved towards the forecastle of the ship. In many places, the deck boards were so hot that you couldn't touch them, and breathing was difficult because there was now thick and heavy smoke, which I can imagine only added to their terror. Can you imagine it's so hot that you can't even safely stand above on the deck to try to find a way to get off? As conditions grew steadily worse, the decision became jump or burn for a lot of the passengers. However, jumping into the water was extremely problematic due to the storm caused at the hands of the high wind and current, and it made waves basically impossible to try to swim through, especially that in the morning with limited visibility. I can hardly swim through, like, some pretty mildly intense waves coming at shore, let alone an actual storm causing severe waves. On the deck's burning ship, the crew and passengers exhibited a full range of reactions to the disaster at hand. Some of the crew members were incredibly brave and tried to fight the fire. Others tossed deck chairs and life rings overboard to try to provide people in the water with makeshift flotation devices. Only six of the 12 lifeboats were actually launched. Boats 1, 3, 5, 9, and 11 on the starboard side and boat 10 on the port side. Although the combined capacity of these boats were able to easily carry 408 people, they only carried 85. Most of them were crew members, and many of the passengers died for a lack of knowledge on how to use the life preservers. As they hit water, life preservers knocked many people unconscious, leading to a subsequent drowning or broke the victim's neck from impact, killing them instantly. Again, rescuers were really slow to react. The first rescue ship had arrived in the scene was the Andrea F. Luckenbach. Two other ships, the Monarch of Bermuda and the City of Savannah, were slow in taking action after receiving the SOS, but did eventually arrive on the scene. The fourth ship to participate in the rescue operations was President Cleveland, which launched a motorboat that had made a cursory circuit around the Morano Castle and upon seeing nobody in the water along her route, retrieved the motorboat and left the scene. 
Coast Guard vessels Tampa and Cahoon positioned themselves too far away to see the victims in the water and rendered very little, if any, actual assistance to this. The Coast Guard's aerial station at Cape May, New Jersey, failed to send their floating planes until local radio stations started reporting that dead bodies were washing up onto the shore of New Jersey beaches. And from that point, Pleasant Beach to Springs Lake. In some time, additional small boats had arrived on the scene. The large ocean swells presented a horribly huge problem, not only making it difficult to see people in the water, but obviously imaginably difficult for anyone still alive in the water to remain treading. A plane that was piloted by Harry Moore, governor of New Jersey and commander of the New Jersey Guard, helped boats find survivors and bodies by dipping its wings and dropping them like markers. At this point, telephone calls and radio stations spread the news of the disaster all along New Jersey coasts. Local citizens assembled on the coastline to nurse wounded that were washing up and retrieve the dead, trying to unite families that had been scattered among different rescue boats that had been landing on the New Jersey beaches. By mid-morning, the ship was totally abandoned of any former still-living passengers and ship crew members, and its burning hull drifted ashore coming up to stop late that afternoon in shallow water off Amesbury Park, New Jersey, at almost the exact spot where the new era had wrecked in 1854. The fires continued to smolder for the next two days, and in the end, 135 passengers and crew out of a total of 549 were lost. It was declared an absolute and total loss, and its charred hull was finally towed away from Ashbury Park, Shoreline, March 14, 1935. According to one account, it was later stated settling by the stern and sank being towed and had to be refloated. Other accounts have that the ship was towed without any issue, but regardless, it was towed to Gravesend Bay and then Baltimore on March 29th of 1935, where it was scrapped. The next couple of months, because of the proximity to the boardwalk in Asbury Park, Hall's Convention Pier, it was possible to wade out and touch the wreck with one's hands. The wreck was basically treated as a destination for sightseeing trips and completely stamped with penny souvenirs and postcards for sale along the shore. Some of the factors that might have contributed to the fire being this intense or happening at all were the design of the ship and the materials used in her construction. There is questionable crew practices and a lot of mistakes that had escalated the onboard fire to a roaring inferno that eventually did and would destroy the ship. As far as the materials used in the construction were concerned, it was an elegant but highly flammable decorated ship, veneered in wooden surfaces, glued ply paneling, and that obviously did nothing but help the fire spread quicker. The ship's structure also lacked a lot of safety features. The structure of the ship also created a number of problems. Although the ship did have fire doors, there existed a wood line six inch opening between the wooden ceilings and the steel bulkheads and that provided the fire with flammable pathways that bypassed any of the fire doors, enabling it to spread farther even when shut. The ship did have electrical sensors that could detect fires in any of the ship's staterooms and crew quarters, offices and cargo holds and engine rooms. But there were no detectors in lounges, dance halls, writing rooms, libraries, tea rooms or dining rooms. There were 42 water hydrants on board. The system was designed with the assumption that no more than six would ever have to be used at any one time. And when the emergency on board happened, the crew opened virtually all of the working hydrants, dropping water pressure to unusable levels everywhere. The ship's Lyle gun, which is basically something that's designed to fire a line to another ship to facilitate like evacuation and emergency measures, was stored over the Morrill Castell's writing room, which was where the fire originated in the first place. That had exploded before 3 a.m., further spreading fire, breaking windows, and allowing near gale force winds to enter the ship and fan the flames. Finally, fire alarms did go off and the ship produced a muffled, scarcely audible ring according to the passengers that did survive. So there was a lot of crew practices and overall deficiencies in the safety measures that could have been taken by the ship. 
and that added severity to the already on board and worsening fire. According to surviving crewmen, painting the ship had been a common practice to keep it looking new and keep people busy. Unfortunately, the thick layers of paint that resulted from this practice made the ship way more flammable and strips of the paint broke off during the fire, helping spread it faster. The storage locker that originally started the fire, or is thought to originally have started the fire, was holding blankets that had been dry cleaned using 1930s methods, which utilized flammable dry cleaning fluids. Although it's unlikely that a huge amount of the fluid would remain once thoroughly dried, the ship had doors that had automatic trip wires. They were supposed to close when a certain temperature was reached and those had been disconnected. None of the crew had thought to operate them manually at the time of the fires either. That being said, again, just due to the wood being around them, it's extremely unlikely that they would have made much of a difference because it still would have allowed fire to spread past them even if they had closed the steel portions of the dogs. Many of the host stations on the promenade deck had been recently deactivated in response to an accident about a month before when a passenger had slipped on the deck that was let because of a leaking hose at the station and sued the line. Although regulations required that fire drills be held on each voyage, only the crew members participated and passengers never required to attend. For quite some time after the fire, the ship continued on its course and speed, pointed directly at the wind. No doubt this helped fan the fire. In an attempt to reach passengers in some suites, crewmen broke windows on several decks, but that only allowed wind to enter the ship more and hastened it into more of like a fiery inferno similar to like a hellscape by some accounts. Because wire operators couldn't get in touch with the ship anymore to get a definitive answer from the captain, the SOS wasn't significantly ordered until 318 and wasn't fully sent out until 323. Within five minutes, the intense heat of the fire began to distort the signal and the emergency generators failed very soon after, so all transmissions ceased. A lot of inquiries that followed the disaster and criticism of the response of the first officers and the rest of the crewmen and women responses to the fire and the delayed calling for assistance were really heavily scorned. The inquiries concluded that there was no organized effort by the officers to fight or control the fire close fire doors, or maintain making any severe rescue efforts. Additionally, the crew made no effort to take regular fire stations. More damaging was the conclusion that, with a few notable exceptions, the crew made no direct effort to save passengers or get them to a pathway where the lifeboats were. Many passengers, only of course the ones that were able to take action on their own, lowered themselves into the water or had to jump overboard. The few lifeboats that were launched carried almost primarily crew members, and there was no effort by these boats to maneuver around and try to pick up additional people. Following that investigation, it was also noted that the newly promoted captain had never left the bridge to determine the extent of the damage and maintained the ship's bearing at full speed for some distance before ever attempting to slow it down. And this was after the fire was already well known to be causing a mass amount of damage. As systems failed throughout the entire ship because of power loss, no effort was made to use the emergency steering gear or emergency lighting. The captain and vice president were eventually indicted on various charges relating to the incident, including a willful negligence charge. All three were convicted and sent to jail. However, there were appeals made in court later to overturn Warm and Abbott's convictions, deciding that a fair amount of blame could be attributed to the death of the captain previously. In the inquiry that followed the disaster, the chief radio officer, George White Rogers, was made out to be a hero because of having been unable to get clear orders from the bridge, he sent a distress call of his own accord amidst life-threatening conditions. Later, however, suspicion was directed his way when he was convinced of attempting to murder his police colleagues with an incendiary device. Additionally, his crippled victim, Vincent Bud Doyle, spent the better part of his life attempting to prove that Rogers had set the Morrell Castle on fire. In 1954, Rogers was convicted of murder. That was of a neighboring couple for money. He had died three and a half years later in prison.
The New York Times reported that the end of the inquiry on March 27, 1937, with an order by federal judge John C. Knox asphyxing a liability at $890,000 on average of $2,225 per victim. About half of the claims were for deaths. The order reportedly included in an agreement by 95% of the claim, the claim makers, the people who survived, or their families. The order also barred further claims against the steamship company and its subsidiaries. Several months of work remained in deciding each claim individually by the lawyer and members of the Morrell Castle Committee. Damages were fixed under the Death on the High Seas Act. So the causes are extremely hard to get into, in my opinion, because there was never officially a cause directly set on this ship, which is why it's kind of a ghost story. It's more of an unknown slash unsolved. Officially, the fire's cause was never determined. In the mid-1980s, HBO television aired a dramatization of the fire with an episode on their catastrophe series that was titled Mystery of the Morrow Castle. The dramatization starred a John Goodman as a radio officer, George Rogers, and blamed Rogers for causing the fire. In 2002, A&E Television Network made a documentary about the incident. Both HBO and A&E's documentary reawakened speculation that the fire was actually arson committed by a crew member. Other theories, however, also include a short circuit in the wiring that passed through the rear of the lockers, spontaneous combustion of chemically treated blankets in the lockers, or overheating of the ship's functioning funnel situated just aft of the lockers. A well-known writer, William McPhee, had served as an engineer on oil-filtered steamers, wrote in 1949 that if the burners were neglected, the long uptakes which lead from the furnace to the funnel would become dangerously overheated as he had once found that out on another ship whose funnel was glowing red hot just above the uptakes. The Murano Castle's funnel was clad in basically completely covered in flammable material, where it passed through the passenger quarters and several people had noticed smoke as early as midnight. The ship was making 19 knots against a 20-knot headwind and simply overheated, according to McPhee in his account. But the high loss of life was caused by an incompetence in the crew and the handling of an emergency. Furthermore, a Cuban writer, Rene Mendez, was aboard when the tragedy happened on the route to New York City, where she would travel to Paris to take some administration over the Cuban consulate there. Trapped in her cabin as the ship became engulfed in flames, she was luckily found by crew members because of her corpulence. She had been removed through a hatch, and the American steward, Carol Pryor, gave her his flotation device, therefore saving her life effectively. Upon her arrival in New York City, she was interviewed by the American press because she expressed sympathy with the Cuban Communist Party. She was accused of being a communist agitator and the author of the fire that basically destroyed the ship completely. That fire is undoubtedly the worst memory I've ever had, she recalled. Some of the victims of the fire were buried in Mount Prospect Cemetery, Neptune, New Jersey, along the coast. The Morrell Castle's radio call sign, KGOV, is still registered to the ship FCC more than 80 years after her demise. It's therefore unavailable to use by broadcast stations. On September 8th of 2009, the first and only memorial to the victims, rescuers, and survivors of the castle disaster was dedicated on the south side of the Convention Hall in Amesbury Park near the very spot where the burned-out hull of the ship finally came aground. The day marked the 75th anniversary of the disaster. You can now see the Morrow Castle ship bell at Sunny Maritime Fort Schneider. It's basically like a little maritime museum. If you like this case or want to know about more unsolved strange mysteries, make sure you leave a comment on which one you'd like to hear more about and give a thumbs up and subscribe so you never miss another episode. I hope you have a good rest of your day. I hope you hydrate and stay safe. Definitely an interesting story. It's extremely fascinating to me that they could never actually give a direct reason 
for the fire, but I guess that is why it remains a mystery to this day. See you next time.